Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this evening. We're really excited to be here and to have this opportunity to share this information with you. So tonight we're talking about food for thought, nourishing the second brain. We'll move to the next slide. So who are we? Uh, we are Megan Squared. <laughs> uh, Megan Barefoot is the founder and owner of No Shoes Nutrition, and I came on board uh, on in November of this past year. And together we uh, offer a variety of different options for nutritional counseling from one-to-one -one counseling, group programs, and doing things like this, having uh, talks to wonderful people like you. So tonight we will be covering uh, it's kind of like, this is like a primer on the gut, if you will, and understanding how the gut works with the brain um, to help us achieve our best health. So we're going to be talking about what the second brain is, what the gut brain connection is, how it works, what our gut bugs are and how they're involved in all of this. And then at the end, we'll be talking about uh, foods for thought. So nourishing the second brain. Um, what do you think brain fog, low energy, digestive issues, emotional issues, anxiety, gas, bloating, um, and many other issues, what do all of these have in common? They sound like things that might be unrelated because they're in different parts of the body, but they're way more connected than you think because they all lead back to the same place. So Hippocrates, who is the father of modern medicine, he's known for two famous sayings. First is one that many people have heard, all disease begins in the gut. And another one that's even more famous is let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. So we've learned a lot since Hippocrates days and we've moved beyond some of the very crude and basic barbaric practices of early medicine like bloodletting or drilling holes in the skull to cure headaches uh, but these two sayings of Hippocrates hold true today, and they were almost lost as medicine tried to move past these two foundational principles for health and wellness. So one question for you tonight is, and I'd love for you to actually put this in the chat, your answer to this question, is what does health mean to you? Is it the absence of pain? Does it mean having lots of energy, longevity, and vitality? Uh, if you could let us know in the chat what health means to you, we'd love to see what you have to say. So in the Western world, we, take, we tend to take a very reactive approach to our health. We live our lives, we eat and drink what we want, we ignore our poor sleep, weight gain, and stress levels until there's a major problem. And until that problem comes, we don't really think very much about what's going on in our bodies. And we typically assume that we're going to have frequent problems uh, with things like digestive issues, constipation, acid reflux, headaches, general aches and pains. And the enormous amount of over-the-counter medication that's sold every year is a major testimonial to that. We often think that there's a normal amount of sickness or pain that's a part of life. But what if we took a proactive approach to our health and recognized that most of these things are dependent on our gut health and that our gut health affects the main health systems in every part of our body. So gut health is all the rage right now. It's everywhere. We hear about it um, in the media and through social media. There are foods and supplements all over the place to support the gut. But if we use them just like a Band-Aid, just like every other medication, we're still just masking the problem instead of dealing with it. So our gut health is directly connected to our brain health. They have a very close, very vital relationship. And so much so that the gut is actually known as the second brain. Uh, there's constant communication going on between the gut and the brain and its importance really can't be overstated if we want to live well and have the health and longevity we want. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Megan to talk to us about the gut brain connection. Thanks, Megan. Um, everyone's answers in the chat are amazing. It's obvious that um, the people that have come out today are already thinking about truly what health is. And all we want to do here tonight is talk about um, how nourishing the gut and the brain together can bring that longevity and that vitality and energy and what are some of the other words, harmony back into the body. So 
this slide right here, and I, I always refer to over here and people are like, what are you talking about? I have a, I have a screen over here. So if I'm pointing over here, I'm sorry. Um, this is the perfect diagram to introduce the concept of the gut brain connection. It demonstrates that the gut has influences on neurotransmitters, stress response, our moods and behaviors, things that we've always thought came from our brain up here. It also begins to tell the story about how the brain can affect our gut motility or how fast our bowels are moving, the delivery um, of nutrients, and how it has an influence on our microbial balance. What does that even mean? Well, stay tuned. We're going to keep talking about that microbial balance. But first, let's go a little bit deeper into what is that second brain. Before I dig into the microbes, I want you all to think about the last time you had a gut-wrenching experience. Maybe you had some butterflies in your belly. Have you ever gone with your gut feeling? I was just talking to a client today about their gut feelings. Well, these are all signals from your second brain. So, and the, the other way around works as well. Close your eyes and think about Christmas dinner or that your favorite burger or your you know favorite meal on this planet. And what is happening in your body right now, you guys? Did you know that that simple act of thinking about food starts the release of all those gastric juices and enzymes and everything that's going on down in your gut? Your body right now, just because we were thinking about food, is preparing for digestion. And these are simple things that, you know, most people are not standing around their kitchen thinking about on a daily basis. But these simple things demonstrate, I think I bumped the slide forward. Um, these simple things, or was that you, Meg? Um, these simple things mostly, most people don't stop and think about on a daily basis, like I was saying, but they demonstrate that connection between our gut and our brain. And this goes even deeper. We know that our head has always been our first brain. It's what we've learned all the way through school. When we talk about anatomy, where's your brain? It's in your head. We call the head and our spinal cord as all of our central nervous system. And this is the one we've learned all the way through. It's the one that's running the show. It's helping us on our math tests. And it's, you know, getting us through those difficult um, biochemistry classes and all those things like that. But is that just all? Did you know you have a second brain and that is down here in our gut? And guess what? It has its own nervous system and that nervous system is called the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system actually consists of over a hundred million nerve cells that line your intestines all the way from your esophagus out the other end. Your enteric nervous system is so extensive that it can operate independently without input from that central nervous system. And they always are in regular communication. Your gut may not be the one that's helping you solve those complex mathematical equations directly, but it controls a multitude of functions in the body and supports your first brain more than you might think. What connects our first brain and our second brain is more than just that extensive network of neurons and, and, um, and electrical signals that are going through there. It's also a highway of chemicals, hormones, neurotransmitters that are constantly giving and providing feedback between the two. Um, they talk about how hungry we are, we are, what kind of stress we're under, if we've had a, ingested a bad food with a bad gut bug and what that kind of trouble that's going to create for the body and how to handle it. So you maybe might be thinking after all of this, why is our gut the only organ that needs its own brain? Well, is it just to manage and process digestion? Could it be that one, the one job of our second brain is to listen to the trillions of microbes residing in our gut? Let's talk about that a little bit. So recent research has actually suggested that 90%, you guys, 
90% of all the cells in the human body are located in your microbiome. Your microbiome is what we call those microbes that are living in your gut. First of all, I just want to explain something. Think of yourself before you get all grossed out and worried about this and all these microbes. Think of yourself as a donut, okay? This is the outside of you. This tube that goes through the middle of you and takes some curvy turns along the way is also the outside of you. Okay, so basically what science is telling us is that those microbes that live in that tube residing in our gut are actually more prevalent than we are human. Basically, we're more bacteria, yeast, microbe than we are human. We've learned that the microbes residing in our gut are absolutely vital. I cannot even stress that point more. And we're, we're learning more and more about this all the time, that we need that microbiome in order to stay our healthiest. First, I should warn you, there is actually a war being fought in your gut 24 hours a day. Let that sink in a little bit. Mind blown. You have different kinds of microbes down there and they are all vying for top position. They all wanna be the big guy on campus. So there are good gut bugs and these are the ones that help us and help us with our health and stay on top of our game mentally, physically. And there's um, gut bugs that do pretty much nothing. Well, we, as far as we know so far, we're still doing a lot of research down there to figure that out, but they don't do any harm. They don't do any good. They live off some of the stuff we eat and, you know, they're just there for the ride. It's okay. They're not doing anything to, you know, hamper our physical or mental um, selves. But there are also some bad gut bugs. And I should probably mention that they're only really bad gut bugs if they're the ones in charge. So if they're always going to be there and they may, we're even trying to discover right now, there's a lot of research on whether or not it's important for them to be there in small amounts. But we don't want those guys in charge because when those guys are in charge, they wreak havoc on our body and our mind. And when the gut is not in balance, that is what we refer to as a state of dysbiosis or imbalanced microbiome. Now, one of the questions I get quite a bit about this topic is, where the heck do we get these microbes from? Where do these gut bugs even come from? Sometimes I hesitate on whether I really want to tell people this because it can kind of, again, go into that little area where people get a little grossed out. But if you really want to know, and I know you really do because you're here and you're talking about this, um, we are first inoculated with our microbiome as we are born. And so as we pass through the birth canal, we pick up our first mouthful of gut bugs. Okay. So we're going through mom, we pick up our gut bugs, and then guess what? If we are breastfed, human breast milk is full of prebiotics. Prebiotics is the food that the probiotics need to proliferate and thrive in our guts. So it's like mother nature knew what she was doing. Amazing. Um, we can also pick up microbes from the food that we eat. We can pick it up from skin we, and things we touch. The soil that our food grows in is an absolutely essential source of some of the most important gut bugs that we have. And especially my favorite topic, which I'm going to let Megan talk about a little bit later tonight, fermented foods, you guys. And that's a way that we can get some of those probiotics in there and start changing that balance. I could go on forever. I got to cut myself off about the fermented foods right now. So you want to have the good gut bugs, which are referred to as our probiotics, pro meaning good, biotics meaning microbes in life. You want those guys in charge. You want them running the show because when they are in charge, when they're running the show, the benefits 
are so astounding, this may actually blow your mind. So let's talk about that. What are the benefits? We're going to go through six major benefits. There's probably more. We are going to run out of time if I go through all of them, but these are the biggest ones. There's digestion, absorption. They protect us. They produce vitamins. They produce hormones for us, neurotransmitters. And what Robin actually talked about at the very beginning is that they support our immune system through our lymph system. And we're going to touch on that for Robin tonight because we're here at the Lymph Balance Center and that would be bad if we didn't. So we will begin to go into each one of these in a small amount of detail. But the first one and the most important I want to talk about is digestion. And the reason I want to talk about that in such detail and a little bit more detail is because if you're not getting your nutrients from your food broken down, when we eat food, you guys, I wish I had some food here. If When we eat an apple, visualize an apple. When we eat an apple, that apple is not in a form that we can absorb. We can't like touch the apple to us and absorb the nutrients. It has to be broken down, chewing, enzymes, all of these things happen throughout the body and in our gut. And our gut bugs have to help us with that. And so when um, digestion and absorption are not happening, the rest of the body would simply break down, we would be in dire straits and our health would eventually really suffer. Okay, so let's talk about the gut first, because I think this is something that we all should know a little bit more about. So this is your gut, you guys. This is the lining of our intestine. And the next two pictures I just wanna say are from the GAPS training that I've done. I absolutely love these pictures. And when you see the next one, I get just really excited about it. So um, it just makes things a lot more simple. So this is actually the lining of our intestine. Our intestinal system is not a clean, smooth pipe, like a tube that water runs down. It's actually lined with what I would describe more similar to a carpet, okay? So you have all these villi that are lining, lined with little cells called enterocytes. And some of these these um, there's cells there as well that produce uh, mucus. And you can see that on the lining of the gut, there it's only one cell thick, it's very thin. So we wanna protect ourselves, we make mucus to protest, protect that surface. And some of the cells on there are the enterocytes. And each enterocyte has these little hairs on the top of their heads called microvilli. And the microvilli have digestive enzymes that complete the final steps of our digestion so that nutrients can be absorbed through these cells and pass into the blood or the uh, cardiovascular circulatory system or into the lymph, part of the lymph system, okay? Now I would like to introduce you to these beautiful and cute and awesome, I'll call them handsome tonight, enterocytes. On your left, you will meet a healthy enterocyte in all his glory. He's so cute. On the right is a sick enterocyte. And you can see Mr. Healthy Enterocyte over here, he's round, he's plump, he's got lots of hair and lots of digestive enzymes on that hair. And he's wearing a smile. He's very happy. And poor Mr. Sick Enterocyte, he's kind of dilapidated. He's you know wrinkled up, he's lost his hair. There's not a lot of enzymes left on there. It's making our body have to work harder to get the digestion done and get those um, nutrients into our body. This is an enterocyte where our, the gut is actually in a state of dysbiosis, okay? So they, these enterocytes, they don't live very long, or at least they shouldn't have to live very long. They're in a constant state of renewal. And guess what? It's the microbiome, all those good gut bugs that orchestrate the renewal. So the good gut bugs set to work and keep the gut in tip top shape. They clean up debris, they get rid of these old enterocytes and send them on their way. They push waste along and they keep the good healthy enterocytes happy and well taken, well groomed we'll say. Okay, so this is really the basis of why digestion, what they help with with digestion and absorption. Now, the second thing, and some of the other ones we talk about, are protection. 
protection of a healthy microbiome. Um, the microbiome is actually protecting you. And, you know, that kind of seems funny to some people that I've talked to because like, how could these tiny little baby bugs that live in my gut protect me? Um, well, okay, so you're right. They're probably not gonna push you out of the way from oncoming traffic, but um, they are going to continue to fight the good fight down in your gut every single day. And I just wanna say, we are exposed to more and more toxic chemicals and pollutants every day. We have additives and preservatives and herbicides being added to our food all the time. And if you haven't noticed, I'm sure I don't know how you wouldn't notice if you're here in Calgary, but we are breathing tons of smoke right now. That is becoming toxic for our body and we've been doing it for weeks now. Well, if you have a healthy microbiome, these toxins will actually bother you less. They will help to process the toxins and get them out of your gut, out of your body, so you will actually experience less symptoms and less long-term effects, which is really important. And so that is just a minuscule part of how they protect us on a daily basis. Now, the third thing that your gut bugs will do for you is produce lots of vitamins. Vitamins, yep. I said that right, your gut bugs will actually produce the full spectrum of B vitamins, which were are really important for supporting your energy levels, your hormone balance. They would also help you mitigate the effects of stress on your body. So again, that's helping you because with the smoke because that smoke and all the toxins are actually a stress on your body. These little heroes will help you get enough vitamin K. And most people don't really know what vitamin K is, but it's a super powerful vitamin that will help you support your cardiovascular system. It helps keeps your blood clotting when it's supposed to be clotting. It helps keeps your blood flowing when your blood needs to be flowing. It's also great for your bone health. So your microbiome is now helping you keep your bones happy and healthy too. Who knew? Now, the microbiome can help per, um, break down proteins into amino acids, and that ensures that your amino acid pool and your body, that your body uses to build muscles and enzymes and antibodies and neurotransmitters is all full and in working order. So when it comes to hormone support, our microbiome is now being researched and referred to as a, another endocrine gland in our body. And our endocrine glands are actually um, the glands in our body that help us produce hormones or they, they do produce hormones. And for example, us ladies, our ovaries are probably our most well-known endocrine gland and they produce estrogen and progesterone to control, you know, things like our monthly cycle and they play a great role in fertility. Well, guess what? That microbiome that you have in your gut is also being studied because it can help balance your hormones and is now known that good gut bugs can produce estrogenic compounds and help break down harmful estrogenic compounds that can help you make you more fertile and having dysbiosis or that imbalance in your microbiome is now being directly related to fertility issues. So these gut bugs are no joke. We really wanna keep them in balance. And for myself, I think we're on the topic of gut-brain connection here. The most staggering thing that these gut bugs do, did for me and, and do for people that, you know, just blew my mind and really made me take another deep dive into the gut-brain connection was that those little gut bugs, when they're balanced in my belly, they produce 95% of my my serotonin that my brain needs to feel happy, safe, secure. And then I learned that serotonin is actually vital to gut motility and how fast my guts are moving. <sighs> this blew me away, you guys. Someone like myself who has struggled with gut issues my whole entire life, and now I had a connection to my mental wellness as well. I knew I needed to work on balancing my microbiome and my family's gut balance too. And I was on top of this. Like I really took a deep dive here, but that wasn't all. 
50% of our dopamine is also made by our microbiome. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that gives us motivation. It plays a big role in our ability to think and plan. Both of these neurotransmitters influence our moods and our behaviors. All of these vitamins, hormones, neurotransmitters that the microbiome produce for us, these are referred to as our postbiotics. Post meaning they come after we have our prebiotics in there, our probiotics are doing their job, and these are the benefits. These are the products that they make. These come because we have worked to balance a healthy, good, solid microbiome down in our gut. So one last thing I wanted to talk about with regards to the power of the microbiome is the connection to the immune system. Being that we're speaking at the Lymph Balance Center this evening, and it's only fitting that we mention the importance of healthy microbes to support the lymph and immune. What was really interesting to me when I was researching this was that 70% of your immune system, guess what, where it is? It's in your gut. That's right. The bottom third of your small intestine is lined with lymphatic tissue called pears patches, pears patches. And your microbiome stays inside your intestine, but it's constantly in contact and communication with your immune system in that lymphatic, um, those lymphatic tissues. They will warn your body of incoming invaders, foreign particles, changes in the environment down there. This allows our immune system to react appropriately, which is really important. And, you know, when, we, when I was talking about the gut, you can see those villi that were coming up and there was blood vessels in there and there was also lymph tissue and lymph vessels that come up. So everything is exposed to that lymph. And so when your lymph is moving, your gut is happy, your body is more happy, and this is going to give us that longevity and health that we were talking about right at the beginning. But the most important message that I wanna to convey tonight is that your gut and your microbiome can play a major role in your behavior, including your sleep habits, because these little microbes actually have their own circadian rhythms. Interesting, right? They can affect your moods, they can change your desires, and your food preferences too. So if you think sometimes that you're making choices for yourself, you may want to, you know, rethink some ideas because those gut bugs may be influencing you. If you've ever thought maybe you just didn't have the willpower to change your way of eating, perhaps it's time to have a little conversation with those gut bugs because I really truly feel that when the bad guys are in charge, that is when we're reaching for the foods that are less than healthy. And up here we know it, but somewhere that message is getting mixed up or misconveyed and we're reaching for the pop and the processed foods and the sugary foods instead. So now I am going to hand things over to the esteemed Megan Prescott so that she can add some information here about some of the things that we can start adding to our meals to improve our um, microbiome and our health. So she's about to give you some food for thought. So just like Megan was just talking about, it's amazing that the food that we choose to nourish ourselves with, uh, well, sometimes it's not always us choosing to nourish us, ourselves with. Sometimes when our microbiome is out of balance and those uh, bad gut bugs are in charge, they're actually causing us to crave the foods that we really shouldn't be eating and that we know are not the best thing for us. But the awesome thing is that when we make the choice to ignore those signals, and instead we choose to nourish ourselves with food that actually helps to maintain and um, create more diversity in our gut, and then also nourishes our brain, that we can override all of those cravings. We can override a lot of the, um, the emotional and mental 
connections that we have to those foods and it can help us get some a bit of clarity and have some mindfulness around um, how we're actually choosing to, to, to nourish ourselves. So there are a few categories that are really important when we're talking about nourishing this gut-brain connection. We have good fats, probiotics, prebiotics that you've just heard about, fiber, and hydration. So let's talk about good fats, which is one of my favorite subjects. So omega-3 fatty acids are incredibly important for our diets um, because we in our Western food, grocery store, fast food, junk food land that we live in, we have a tendency to get a really high amount of omega-6 fatty acids. We do need some omega-6. Um, there's a good balance that has to be had there, uh, but our omega-3s um, are really quite low in our Western diets, especially if we're eating a lot of refined foods, grains, um, and sugar-based uh, products. So omega-3s are extremely important for microbiome diversity. So we don't just have one kind of good gut bug in there. We have a variety of good gut bugs. So this helps to actually keep that diversification going. Uh, Omega-3s help with our cell communication. So when we're talking about this connection between the gut and the brain, it's so important that our brain and our gut can actually talk to each other. And if things aren't doing well in the gut, and if our nerve conduction isn't happening very well, if our neurotransmitter levels are too low, uh, then we don't get that kind of good communication flowing. And omega-3s actually help with that cell communication. They're quite vital to it. They're also extremely important for our brain function. I'm sure many of you have heard the terms EPA and DHA, uh, and they're very long terms that I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce here tonight, uh, but these are two um, types of omega-3 fatty acids that are incredibly crucial to our brain health. So they help to protect from cognitive decline. And what are some of the foods that we can find these omega-3s in? Uh, wild caught salmon and the wild caught part of it is very important because they're eating their natural diet um, out in the ocean. They're not being fed things like corn. Um, they're not being raised in confinement. And um, when an animal is raised in that way or a fish is raised that way, then we don't get the same uh, fatty acid profile from it. And the same goes for grass fed and finished beef. So when a cow is being raised on pasture and um, is eating grass, which is exactly how it's designed uh, to, to live, uh, the fatty acid profile that ends up in that meat at the very end for something for us to eat has a really great omega-3 ratio in it. Some other great options are walnuts, flaxseed oil, and chia seeds. So if you can include these in your diet on a regular basis, that's a great way to get um, some more omega-3s. And then saturated fats are super important for ma maintaining our brain integrity. So we've been taught for a really long time to be scared of fat, especially saturated fat. And there were some studies done a long time ago that were kind of perpetuated through a lot of um, interesting ideas uh, that didn't really have a lot of sound science behind them. And so now we're starting to understand a lot more about this. Um, a lot more research is going into how important these fats are for our brain health. So things like ghee, which is a clarified butter, uh, butter itself, especially when it comes from grass-fed cows, um, MCT oil, which is a medium chain triglyceride that comes from coconut oil and palm oil, uh, coconut oil itself um, as a whole product, avocados, and then animal fats from pasture-raised animals. And uh, the, the thing is, our brains are between 60 and 70% fat. So essential fatty acids are absolutely crucial for maintaining our brain health. And saturated fat and cholesterol actually make up most of that fat in our brain. And they need to be there to, as the building blocks for our brain. Studies are also showing these saturated fats play a much bigger role than we used to understand in protecting us from dementia and Alzheimer's. So don't be afraid of those fats, use them in moderation, um, but definitely use them and enjoy them. So the next, uh, group of foods that we're going to talk about are probiotic foods. So we know that there are probiotics happening in our gut. Well, we can influence those, the, again, the diversity of what's going on in our gut by eating probiotic foods. So we can do that with fermented foods and drinks. 
And a really important distinction I wanna make right off the bat. Uh, the first couple things on my list here are sauerkraut, pickles, um, hot sauce, and some other condiments. Now you see the words lacto-fermented or fermented with those foods. And that's incredibly important because if you go to the grocery store and you buy a, you know, a jar of Bix pickles off the shelf, that is not a fermented product and it's not gonna give you um, the probiotic benefit. What you need to do is go to the refrigerated section and look for something like Bubby's pickles, which is one that's kind of all over the place, um, or uh, specifically lacto-fermented sauerkraut. So the, the wine sauerkraut, again, that's been um, pasteurized and canned and put on the shelf does not have that same kind of benefit. So these have to be specifically lacto-fermented. They're always kept in the fridge because if they're kept out of the fridge, eventually the container they're in will explode. So it's really important that you know um, what you're going for if you go to purchase those products. And again, fermented hot sauces and other condiments, um, because of because these things are all the rage right now, there are so many options out there. If you go to places like Community Naturals or the Light Cellar here in Calgary, they have a lot of amazing products there um, that you can try and find your favorite one. Um, and that and kimchi as well is one of those. So you have to make sure once again that it's that it's true kimchi that has been fermented. Some other ones that um, we're very familiar with are things like yogurt and creme fraiche, cultured sour cream. But again, here it's really important to read your labels because not all yogurt is made equal. So if your yogurt has been sweetened, um, if, it's, if it's had a lot of other things added to it and you look on the label and there's a bigger list of additives in it than just the, the cream and milk that it's been made from and the added probiotics, you're probably not getting a probiotic product in the end. So it's best to go as much as possible with especially organic grass fed where you can, um, but make sure you read your labels and know for sure that there are live cultures in that yogurt. Um, creme fraiche is a great option for that as well. Cultured sour cream, not just the regular sour cream, it has to say that it's cultured. Uh, cheese is also an awesome option, but not the brick of orange plastic but that you buy again in that in that refrigerator section at the grocery store it definitely needs to be a higher quality cheese um, grass-fed if possible um, from grass-fed cows um, and that will have some beneficial bacteria in it as well because cheese is basically bacteria uh, some other options that are really popular right now are kombucha and kefir you do want to check the label for the amount of sugar that's going into those products and again, because of the popularity of these things, I'm now starting to see kombucha in cans on the shelf at the grocery store. It ain't kombucha. I can tell you that much because it would explode if it was left uh, like that, if it's the real thing. So if you're buying it from a shelf, it's pasteurized, it's dead, it's not a real food. But if you're buying it from the refrigerated section, always flip over the label, make sure that the sugar count is lower on it because some of them in order to become a little bit more palatable to the population. They're adding a bit more juices and, and fruits and that sort of thing. So you can get up to a pretty high sugar count. So you wanna make sure you're looking out for that. And then kefir is fantastic and you can get it in different forms, wa uh, milk kefir, water or coconut. And then uh, miso and tempeh are also fantastic options which are a form of fermented soybean products. And you can find most of those at um, health food stores as well. And then the next category is prebiotic foods. So prebiotics are just the coolest thing because they are what feeds our gut bugs. Uh, prebiotics are basically the non-digestible plant foods or fiber that are in a lot of different foods. Not all fiber is prebiotic um, and not all fiber containing foods have prebiotic fiber in them. Um, so it's good to know a basic list of some things that you can go to that are specifically prebiotic fibers. So prebiotics actually feed our gut bacteria, our good gut bacteria. Um, this is what our good gut bacteria thrives on and actually needs in order to, um, to be healthy because that our gut bugs basically take that fiber and they convert that fiber over into those short chain fatty acids and vitamins that Megan was talking about earlier. So prebiotics include things like something called resistant starch, 
as well as complex soluble fiber. Um, resistant starches are a really cool thing that they're really just getting into the research on. Um, but some things that contain that resistant starch are things like green bananas. So you think, why would I ever want to eat a green banana? It tastes terrible. It sticks to my tongue and it's not very good. Well, the thing is, as a banana ripens, the sugars ripen as well. So the earlier you can eat a banana closer to, we don't, we're not saying to eat a completely green banana uh, off the shelf, but before it turns and goes completely yellow and, and or brown with spots on it, which is great for making banana bread, but not so great for your good gut bugs, it will definitely feed your bad gut bugs with all of that sugar. Um, before it gets to that point, it forms something called resistant starch. And that resistant starch is excellent food for your gut bugs. So on this list of foods that I have here, we have things like asparagus and apples, which everyone is familiar with. And then we have things like Jerusalem artichokes, jicama and kohlrabi. And some people might say, what the heck are those? Well, these days I see them everywhere. Um, so if you shop at farmer's markets, go to smaller grocers that bring in um, slightly different things. But right now I'm seeing kohlrabi at all of the farmer's markets. And they're just vegetables that we're not as commonly familiar with in North America, but that have amazing prebiotic fibers. They're delicious. They can be eaten raw for the most part after they're peeled. Um, and they can make a great crunchy snack uh, instead of chips or something like that. And then things that we all know about sweet potatoes, raw garlic, raw onion. So if you make your own um, dressings, for instance, your own salad dressings, you can add in raw garlic and raw onion and get that prebiotic benefit. And then things like parsnips, leeks, dandelion greens. What? Dandelion greens? Absolutely dandelion greens. Not only are they prebiotic, and this is not something you want to be picking from the side of the sidewalk or the path up at Nose Hill Park. Um, if you have the opportunity to grow some dandelions in your own backyard that are going to be untainted, um, that would be great. Uh, but you can also actually um, go out in nature and harvest them yourself um, away from the city, away from pollution and other things that can contaminate them. Um, and you can also buy them very often, uh, especially early in the spring, or you can buy them in forms of tea. Uh, and tea is a really great way to consume them for lots of the liver cleansing benefits. Uh, and then one of my favorites is cacao. How exciting is that? So cacao is a prebiotic food. So if you grab some cacao nibs and add those to um, your smoothies or your chia pudding in the morning, sprinkle them on whatever baking you're doing. They add a really nice crunch and they give you lots of that prebiotic fiber. And then finally, sprouted or fermented whole grain uh, of wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Now the really important thing here is that they are sprouted or fermented um, and then organic for sure, because otherwise you're putting a big pesticide load into your body as well. And sprouted or fermented grains um, are really important because when you sprout or ferment them, you're actually neutralizing some of the um, less beneficial properties in those grains and you're actually releasing the nutrients so that your body can absorb them and so that you're not being blocked from absorbing them. And then finally, we need to talk about fiber and hydration because these are also essential for your gut. So there are multiple forms of fiber. We've talked about a couple of them tonight already. We've talked about prebiotic fiber. We've talked briefly about soluble fiber, which your gut bugs can eat. But then we have insoluble fiber as well, um, which isn't really broken down very much by us or our gut bugs, but it really helps our gut bacteria because it helps us to poop better, which is incredibly important for maintaining the balance in our gut. It helps us it, the fiber itself actually absorbs toxins, excess hormones, other pathogens that are hanging out in our gut that we don't really want to be there. Um, and then that helps to remove things. So that's why fiber is so important um, in every form for our gut microbiome. So we wanna aim for at least 25 grams a day. Uh, if you're nowhere near that right now, don't jump in and eat 25 grams of fiber tomorrow, please. And thank you very much because you will not like us and you will be spending a very long time sitting on the toilet. Uh, so if you're currently eating a less than 25 gram a day uh, fiber diet, you'll wanna slowly inch that up, start with some vegetables and then maybe start adding some slightly higher fiber options like chia or flax later on. 
So next is hydration, hydration, hydration. So we can't say it enough. Uh, water is critical to life. We need it for every part of our entire body. Every system of our body needs water to survive. And here's the thing. We're usually willing to take a shower just about every day, right? Or jump in the pool or, or whatever it is. We're willing to wash the outside of our body because we don't want germs and bacteria that shouldn't be there to be there. Well, the same thing goes for the inside. If we're not washing the inside with water, then stuff is going to stick around that's really not supposed to be there. So one of the most important functions that water performs when it's in our bodies is to actually move all of that junk through our system. And then it can meet up with the fiber. It Fiber absorbs the water a little bit. That helps with our bowel motility, helps everything to move through more smoothly. But also it's an, it's an, an incredibly important part of actually just moving all of that literal crap out of our systems. So the uh, rule of thumb is generally to aim for about half your body weight in ounces of water each day. Um, so for the average adult, that does work out to somewhere between six to eight glasses. Um, and we're talking proper glasses, like a good 16 ounces, um, uh, six to eight times a day. And I think I already talked about the last point that hydration is critical to move everything through the digestive tract and to help avoid constipation. Because if you suddenly start increasing your fiber and you don't increase your hydration as well, then you're gonna be stuck in the bathroom for quite some time as well. So these are all foods that are, are absolutely essential to the well-being of our brains, our first brain, our second brain, and really keeping everything moving through our systems as they should. So the next question is, how are you doing? How is your gut microbiome doing? And could you use some support to help figure out what's going on, what might be out of balance if you're experiencing any of the symptoms that we talked about early on this evening? So what we can do for you at No Shoes Nutrition is we do one-on-one -on -one nutritional counseling. So we can do a deep dive into your health and really take a look at every body system to figure out what's out of whack um, and how to get you back on track with your nutrition to support your health at every level of your body, right down to the cellular level. And then we also have online group programs that we run a few times a year. Um, and th these are really fun ways to kind of jumpstart your health, get a reset going. If you just know that things aren't quite right and you could use just a little, a little push to go in the right direction, group programs are a great way to do that with a group of people uh, that keep it pretty fun. So for more information, you can go to our website at www.noshoesnutrition.com. Uh, and if you visit our website, you can book a free 30 minute consult with either Megan or Megan, and we would be happy to help you with that. You can find us at our website um, where we have blogs on Facebook, where we post content regularly and as well on Instagram. So if you go on to Facebook or Instagram and you search No Shoes Nutrition, you will find us there. So thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk to you about this critical, crucial part of our health. Um, thank you to the Lymph Balance Center for um, putting on this speaker series and giving us the opportunity to talk tonight. I would just like to add thank you to everyone as well. It's been such, such a pleasure and we are definitely looking forward to coming back next year for more um, great talks on your gut and um, in your lymph maybe too.